did not wait for me to make myself a worthy man. You did not wait for me to make a righteous stand. For there was nothing I could do, and in sin I had Good morning. Welcome to Hope Lutheran Church of Chino Valley, Arizona. We're glad you tuned in today for our live stream worship on this Independence Morning. We're also glad you worshipers are here this morning. Guests, we're glad you are worshiping with us as well as members. Uh, Please remember to pray for all those who are traveling today and at this time. If you look around, you'll notice there are a lot of holes and that's because we have people out of town. Today, we're going to talk about freedom I guess it's fitting on Independence Day, but we're going to look at the freedom from tyranny that our Savior Jesus Christ won for us because Christ set us free. God bless your worship today as we begin with the very first hymn, which is, In You, O Lord, I Put My Trust. Please arise. <clears throat> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. 
God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. O Lord our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace, joy, and freedom through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson for today, the sixth Sunday after Pentecost, comes to us from Jeremiah's Lament, the book we know as Lamentations, chapter 3. The people of Judah lamented at their sins, at their situation and their exile, their lack of freedom because of God's will. Jeremiah points out to them their loving God. By the mercies of the Lord we are not consumed, for his compassion does not fail. They are new every morning. Great 
is your faithfulness. My soul says, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good to hope quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bears a yoke early in his life. Let him sit alone and be silent, because the Lord has laid this upon him. Let him stick his face in the dust, perhaps there still is hope. Let him turn his cheek toward the one who strikes him. Let him be filled with disgrace, for the Lord will not push us away forever. Even though he brings grief, he will show compassion on the basis of his great mercy. Certainly it is not what his heart desires when he causes affliction, when he brings grief to the children of men. This is God's word. Please join with me now in singing the psalm for today, which is Psalm 30 on page 76 in the front of the hymnal. Children, come on up for the children's message. All the children are visitors today. All right. These guys aren't afraid of me at all. Good morning. morning. Thank you. (laughs) I see them all the time. These are two of my grandkids. (laughs) 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 Yeah, well. So I want to ask you a question. You know you have an uncle who's a police officer, right? What do they what do police officers do when somebody commits a crime and they get arrested? That's right. First they put handcuffs on, then they take them to jail, right? What happens when somebody in a court setting, you know, when they go to the courthouse for their trial, is found guilty by a jury? Where does the judge sentence that person to go? (laughs) 
we have work to do. <laughs> Not jail, but prison, right? And they don't have freedom, do they? They're locked up. They can't get away. In the same way, when we're born, we're born as sinners, right? We're brought into the world without sin. I mean, without uh, righteousness. We're brought in as sinners. And so we're kind of put in a prison of our own making, the prison of sin. And with sin comes guilt. And with sin and guilt comes death. You know, we're born into death spiritually, and then he makes us alive with Christ Jesus, right? So we need Jesus to set us free. In life, many times things happen that we feel imprison us, sometimes self-inflicted, sometimes just the circumstances, like the people of Judah that uh, Jeremiah talked about in our first reading, or what people have to deal with when their child dies, like we're going to hear about in the gospel we need to know that Jesus makes us free from those things, even though it doesn't always look that way. We are free from the prison house of, of guilt and God's punishment. And for that, we praise God. Even on Independence Day, which is kind of uh, a nice thing to remember for our country, but um, God's kingdom, of course, is bigger than that, and the freedom he gives lasts forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom you give us uh, as your children. And Lord, we pray that you would keep us in your kingdom so we might enjoy the freedoms you won for us through Jesus our entire eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, boys. Going back to your mom. <laughs> Alleluia, alleluia. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm in that freedom then. Alleluia. Please rise for the Holy Gospel for respect to Jesus' words. Today, from Mark's Gospel, we learn that Jesus, who is fully God, has the power to free us even from the tyranny of death. To the world, death looks permanent. To Jesus, just a little bit of a rest. When Jesus had again crossed over in the boat to the other side, that's of the Sea of Galilee, a large crowd gathered around him near the sea. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and repeatedly pleaded with him, My little daughter is near death. Please come and place your hands on her so that she may be healed and live. Jesus went with him. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue ruler's house arrived, saying, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? But when Jesus heard this report, he told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid. Only believe. He did not allow anyone to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. They went into the house of the synagogue ruler, and Jesus saw a commotion with people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. But after he put everyone out, he took the father of the child, her mother, and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Grasping the hand of the child, he said to her, Talitha ka'um. When translated, that means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately, the little girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. They were completely and utterly amazed. Then he gave them strict orders not to let anyone know about this, and he told them to give her something to eat. This is God's word. Please be seated and we'll join in singing the next hymn.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As you know, in the year 1776, on this very day, July 4th, the Continental Congress declared itself, along with its 13 colonies, no longer under the rule of Great Britain. Now, you know, the Declaration of Independence was actually finished two days earlier on July 2nd, but it took that long to get it ready because they made a bunch of copies to be sent out and one to be read. I think the first reading of the, of the Declaration was in the State House in the city of Boston where the Boston Massacre happened right below its balcony. You know all the history, right? The colonials felt that Great Britain was tyrannical in the way they handled the colonies. And so a great portion of those colonists fought for independence from King George III and from Great Britain. Of course, that independence that was declared would have meant absolutely nothing if George Washington hadn't led the colonial armies to victory in the last battle. You know that battle, right? All right. Maybe I should have given out an American history lesson here today. (laughs) But that happened at the city of Yorktown, where the world was turned upside down from the point of view of Great Britain, the mightiest nation on earth at its time. Cornwallis hid in a house in humility, shattered as his troops left the city in front of the colonial forces, and the fife and drum band played the song, The World Turned Upside Down. They couldn't leave by sea, even though they were the mightiest naval force in the world, because the French finally arrived and blockaded it. God works in mysterious ways, I think, even in governments, and through that, we have come to know the United States of America as the freest place on earth to live. You know, in a lot of ways, what the colonials were fighting for, freedom from tyranny, is also what Jesus Christ came to do. If you think about it, Webster describes tyranny, i got to read this so I don't say it wrong, is the arbitrary or unrestrained exercise of power, usually exerted against somebody else who's perceived to be weaker. It's a controlling thing, right? Right? We see it happen all the time. Tyranny is all over the place. It's found in abuse. It's found in countries. It's found in many different places. But Jesus Christ came into the world to destroy the tyranny that affected us. The tyranny of sin. The tyranny of guilt. The tyranny of death. And he did it by setting us free. Christ set you free. Our text for this day comes to us from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, beginning with verse 1 and ending with verse 1. One verse. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not allow anyone to put the yoke of slavery on you again. That's God's word. Christ has set you and me free. Free from tyranny. Free from the tyranny of sin. That kind of unrestrained and arbitrary power that so often takes over in our lives and seeks to crush us. Jesus sets us free from the tyranny of sin. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Yet sin, that arbitrary power that is within our sinful natures, even as God's people continues to wield a lot of power, doesn't it? And sometimes we actually get enslaved by one particular sin or another, one that kind of comes back to us again and again. Of course, modern people like to call it an addiction. But sin is always addicting, quite frankly, isn't it? The Apostle Paul understood that very same fight. He wrote... Indeed, I know that good does not live in me. How's that? 
The great apostle Paul said that word. Good does not dwell, live in me. That is in my sinful flesh. The desire to good, do good is present with me, but I am not able to carry it out. Do you ever feel that way? So I fail to do the good I want to do. Instead, the evil I do not want to do, that is what I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who am doing it, but it is sin living in me. It is a constant battle for me. I hope so for you too. Because if the battle is not raging, you can't understand the freedom in Christ that he set us free from the tyranny of sin. What is it that seems to war against you particularly? See, we're all different with all different strengths and weaknesses. Some of us fight one thing while others fight another. Identify your biggest enemy because the devil will use that in conjunction with the sinful flesh to try to crush you and bring you back once again into slavery to sin. Good thing we have more than just the law, hey, that shows us our sin. Good thing we also have the good news of salvation. This is most important in our fight against sin, that we understand Christ set us free from the tyranny of sin. Paul wrote, we know that our old self was crucified with him to make our sinful body powerless so that we would not continue to serve sin. For the person who has died has been declared free from sin. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Jesus lived that perfect life in our place, did he not? He is true God, but he's also fully human so that he could wipe out the tyranny of sin. Now he did that by coming to this world and placing himself under the same laws of God that we are under. Everything God tells us to do, to love God above all things, our neighbor as ourself, Christ Jesus was subject to as a human being. But as God, he was able to do that perfectly. I wonder what would that be like? to not have a sinful nature warring against us. What would that be like where we wouldn't have to deal with all of the troubles that our sins cause us from relational strains to death itself? Well, one day we're going to know that, but we're still in the fighting church today. We're still fighting this battle. And the good news is that Jesus, who kept the law perfectly, went to the cross and there God punished him instead of you, and instead of me. He punished his son on the cross for the sins of the world, that we might be free. And so Christ set us free from the tyranny of sin. It no longer controls us, but boy, it's still a problem. And so we fight the faith, standing firm in the freedom we have. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus Christ sets us free from the tyranny also of guilt. You know, guilt kind of goes along with sin. I think you know what I mean, right? You know it's wrong to tear somebody's reputation down, right? That's the Eighth Commandment, you shall not bear false witness. And yet there are times we get so frustrated with somebody, we might do that. When we do that, how do you feel about it? When you start thinking about it, how do you feel? Ugh, I did it again, right? I feel terrible at what I did to that person. Now, obviously, we want to go and apologize, repent to God, apologize, repent to the person, but guilt, it seems to be with us all the time, especially as the law of God makes, us very, makes it very clear what he expects of us. And the more we understand that, the more guilty we feel. But remember, guilt is talked about from a feeling point of view, but also from a declaratory point of view. See, by nature, God declares us all guilty. It's a courtroom thing because we have committed the crimes against God who says, be perfect. But God has declared us not guilty through Jesus Christ. He was handed over to death for our sins he was raised to life for our justification. To justify means to declare not guilty. 
That's what the Greek word means. A few weeks back, we talked about the call of Isaiah in our worship, where he has that vision, you know, and he sees the Lord sitting on his throne with the train of his robe filling the temple, and the seraphs are praising him and flying around with their six wings, with two of their six wings. Well, one of them comes up and teaches Isaiah at the beginning of his ministry how important it was to have the tyrannical force of guilt removed. Remember? He touched my mouth with the coal and said, Look, this has touched your lips, so your guilt is taken away and your sin removed. Isn't it nice to know that we are not guilty before God? Because if we stand in our own guilt, what does that mean? It means the prison house of hell. But by faith in Jesus, we have what the writer to the Hebrews said, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all believes. We are free from our guilt. We don't have to stand at the base of the throne of God at his judgment seat and hear him say, guilty to hell with you. Because Jesus already did that in our place and by faith we have his work. Christ set you free from sin. He set you free from guilt. And me too. And that's the thing that gives us joy in life because if we relied on ourselves, we would just end up with the third tyrant, death itself. Christ set us free from the tyranny of death too. Now death reigns over everybody and has ever since our first parents sinned. There's only two exceptions we're aware of where people did not leave this life alive. Or, or dead, I mean. Just Elijah, right? He went up in the whirlwind. And, and uh, Enoch, who walked with God in the year of the flood. Otherwise, everybody dies. It's a fact of our lives. You've all experienced it. Whether that was a parent or a grandparent, or a child, or a brother, or a sister, or a spouse, even pets. All of those things work up in us this dread. Death is not normal, but it's everywhere. God didn't create people to die, but just as sin entered the world through the one man, and death through sin, that's through Adam, and in this way, death came to all people because all who sins, nobody escapes death. And we won't either, primarily, because Jesus hasn't returned. Once he returns, then, of course, those still living in Christ won't ever die. But otherwise, we can expect that to happen. We all age. Our bodies break down. We all are in situations where we realize that that semi coming at me on I-17 can kill me pretty quickly, as it did the other day in the Phoenix area with some people. Death's all around us. Look at the newspaper. You always have an obituary page. I always look at it, make sure my name's not there. That was a Will Rogers joke. The fact of the matter is the, tyrann the tyranny of death has been removed by Christ because he arose from the dead. We saw his power and heard about it in the gospel today as he raises Jairus' daughter. And one day he's going to say your name and my name. And he's going to be able to do that simultaneously. He's God. He can do that sort of thing. And we're going to come from our graves. And those who are alive in Christ are going to be alive again. Uh, their bodies change to the, a life without sin in that body. And we will confess then as we do now, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting, of <clears throat> the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know everything I'm talking about. This is not new to you, is it? 
Christ set you free from the tyranny of sin and guilt and death. You all know that because it comes to us from the truth. Jesus Christ himself is the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no truth apart from Jesus. You wonder why our world, you think of this in the area of politics, for instance, why they can't understand there's a truth? It's because they don't know Jesus. They can't know the truth about themselves or about the world in which they live because they don't know Jesus. We do. That's why it's so frustrating for us living in these times to look at all the shenanigans going on. We know the truth. The wages for sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus, speaking to the Jews who believed in him, said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so we continue to listen to the message of Jesus, which says Christ has set us free. Not just from tyranny, but free for a godly life. Now Paul talks later on in this chapter of Galatians about keeping in step with the Spirit. And it's kind of a neat picture. It's all based on verse 1. Keeping in step with the Spirit. Anybody go to the parade yesterday? I don't want to go in all the crowds. But when you watch a band march or a military unit march, they're all in step, right? Now I, I know about that a little bit because for seven years of my young life, uh, both uh, in middle school age and high school, I competed in a, in a competition band where we were there judged by judges riding horseback or sitting in a grandstand. And you better have your line straight, you better have them both ways, front and sideways, and diagonals, and everybody better be in the same step. Every time somebody's out of step, another point off. We who are the children of God want to keep in step with the Spirit because we've been freed from the tyranny of sin and guilt and death. We can do that because we know the truth. We keep in step with the Spirit. And that enables us to understand it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not allow anyone to put the yoke of slavery on you again. And that comes to the heart of what Paul's talking about in Galatians. See, in the city of, in the province of Galatia, Judaizers had infiltrated the church. Judaizers is just a label we gave to Old Testament believers who wanted to believe in Jesus but keep the Old Testament laws, like eating kosher, like the festivals, and like circumcision. If you want to be a good Christian, then you must do this. Well, that again is a yoke of slavery put on people. You see what I mean? We are free in Christ to live for him without these kinds of rules. In a modern context, it would be somebody coming in and saying, this is the only way you can worship. Where God doesn't speak, they speak because it's easier to have rules. We have to be careful about such things, don't we? We follow the truth of God's word. That's why it's important for us to be peacemakers. Last week we talked about the truth that God reconciled us to himself through Christ. Remember? Okay. To be reconciled means to make peace. We are supposed to be peacemakers because we know the peace of God. The tyrannies have been removed. Get it? We know the truth of God's word, and so we want to be peacemakers. That's really what happened in the early Christian church. Here's just a snapshot uh, from chapter 9 of Acts. The church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. That was after the early persecution and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord, belief in the Lord, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit increased in numbers. We want to keep in step with the Spirit by bringing peace amongst each other and from here to the world so they know the same kind of freedom in Christ. This, while I was on vacation, somebody sent this uh, thing I'm going to quote to you. I've heard it before, but it just made a lot of sense to share this with you today because 
when we are not peacemakers, what are we? Just the opposite, I think. We become like those Judaizers. If you don't become a reconciler of the loss, you will become an evaluator of the saved. You get that point? There is something inerrant in our nature that wants to see people get right with God. And that's in our, our new man, okay, as God's people. And when we don't direct it at the lost, we will direct it at the saved, at believers. Then instead of pursuing sinners, we spend our time policing the saints. All of us have been called to be fishers of men, but when those who have been called to fish don't fish, they fight. When energy that was meant to be used outside the church is used inside the church, church, he's talking about outreach now, the result is explosive. Instead of casting nets, we throw stones. Instead of becoming reachers of the lost, we become critics of the saved. Instead of extending helping hands, we point accusing fingers. Instead of helping the hurting, we hurt the helpers, and sadly, the lost go unreached, the poor go unfed, and the confused go unconsoled. But when those who are called to fish, fish, they flourish. Souls are reached, lives are changed, and the word world is impacted. There's some wisdom in those words, I think, for us as peacemakers, people that bring the gospel of Jesus to others and who live that peace with each other, even if we don't agree on how we're going forward as a group. Those things are very important. We are peacemakers because we understand the peace of God we have, and that frees us to serve in godly love. Serving is not an easy thing because our sinful nature always says, serve me, doesn't it? That's what arrogance and pride are all about. It's all about me. Now, you've heard me say this many times. It's not about me. It's about Jesus Christ and about the people for whom he died. That's why we want to be peacemakers. That's how we keep in step with the Spirit. And that's what we do when we serve one another in love, not to gain anything, but for the benefit of somebody else. We serve in godly love, always standing firm in our freedom. Sometimes we have to make strong statements about what God's Word says because our personal opinions start taking over ministry. I praise God every day. That doesn't happen here very often. It does happen, though, once in a while. And we have to be careful, don't we? Because it always gets in the way of spreading the gospel message that Christ frees us. Now, today, we live in a, in a world that's kind of topsy-turvy, huh? It's turned upside down in so many ways from the way I understood it in this country as a young person. The world seems to have shifted very quickly and in big swings so that a lot of us are wondering, what's tomorrow going to bring? What about the world that my grandchildren have to live in and, and, and serve Christ in? What's that going to be like? I mean, okay, humanly speaking, I don't have all that many years left, right, comparative. I'm, I'm sure I'm over half my life spent. I don't think I'm going to live to 130 anymore. At least I hope not. I'd rather be with the Lord. But what about what's coming? It's unsettling, isn't it? All the bickering and the polarization. People can't even talk to each other. Well, why is that? Well, it's because they're under the slavery of sin. The tyranny of, of guilt is racking them, but they don't want anybody to think they have that, so they stand up and talk big. And they certainly want to avoid the tyranny of death. Our world needs Jesus Christ. They need to know as we come to know by God's grace, we are free in Christ. So let's be peacemakers in an unpeaceful world. No matter what, let's continue to trust in our Savior who forgives our sins, who removed our guilt and gives us life now, and he will give us resurrection life forever. After all, heaven and earth are going to pass away. This truth will not. And let's stand on the truth. Christ has set us free. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we live our life in a turbulent world, 
where sin often is the overriding thing. We pray that you would keep us faithful to Jesus, the truth, that you would always help us to live in the freedom he won for us, freedom from the tyranny of sin and guilt and death. Keep us firmly grounded in the truth of your word that says you love us with an everlasting love, that you will not leave us or forsake us, that we are your children. And then, Lord, prosper and bless our godly service to you as we stand firm in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise now as we respond to God's word, confessing the Christian faith with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Please rise and join with me in prayer. Almighty God, we acknowledge with thanks all that we have and enjoy is a gift from your gracious hand. We come before you today in heartfelt appreciation for our nation and its people. We thank you for enabling us to worship you in freedom and to serve you without fear. You have enriched us with the bounties of farm, ranch, and fa factory the beauty of forest and mountain and the marvels of medicine and science. For all these blessings, we praise and glorify you. Look with favor upon our nation and pre preserve, preserve our cherished liberties. Enable our leaders to govern with wisdom, honesty, courage, and justice. Protect those who serve in the armed forces and those who maintain peace and safety in our communities like our police, sheriff, uh, state patrol and firefighters. Give us willingness to obey our nation's laws and to work for the common financial institute secure and our economy strong. 
Bless our fields that they may produce abundant harvests. Guard us from calamities of nature and accident and spare our land from the ravages of disease and epidemic. Be with those, especially your people who travel at this time of the year on vacations and so on. Teach us not to worry, but to cast all our cares on you, trusting that you care about us. Strengthen the homes of our nation. By your Spirit, lead husbands and wives to love each other, parents to nurture their children, young adults to assume responsibility, children to show respect, single people to live with peace and trust. Lord, we also pray that you would hear us and our special prayers of thanksgiving today for two of our members. One is Miriam Mosher, her husband's here today, who underwent su- successful surgery. And the other is Kitty uh, Kohler, who underwent some severe surgery and will be coming home from the hospital today. O oh God, giver of life, health, safety, and strength, we praise you for having granted these servants of your safety through their surgery May they daily remember your great goodness as they recover now and bring them through, your, through their time of recovery to restoration and, and health. We pray that, that they may serve you with a life that reflects genuine thankfulness for all your blessings through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring to you our private petitions and prayers. You, O Lord, we bring our thanks and our request and pray that you hear our prayers for Jesus' sake, who also taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive with believing hearts the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Please be seated now as we listen to Martin Luther College Choir sing Jesus is Lord. Thanks for joining us in worship today. As always, if you have any comments or thoughts, please send them to me via the email you see on our website. God bless you and give you a happy 4th of July, and we'll see you next week.